finally. Uh, it's great to be at home again and uh, coming back to Porto for a while. And uh, I ask myself to address this topic because this is something that I really feel as a significant problem today for our patients and for us. So when I did my program, I said, Francisco, you are going to talk about cognitive problems after anesthesia and surgery. And the image in the mirror said, oh yes, sir, I will. So uh, for one of these days you want to visit Doha, you are welcome. And my disclosures with uh, Fresenius Scabi, Massimo and M. Dolores. So in the next uh, 40 minutes, maybe, I'll try to show you that probably surgery and anesthesia together are a really aggression to the brain of our patients. We'll see what happens part with uh, particular attention in the old brain and a very brief review about the possible link between anesthesia, surgery, delirium, cognitive problems or cognitive dysfunction after surgery, even dementia. And uh, I'll try to convince you that TIVA is the right anesthesia to go around these problems and also if we monitor the brain during anesthesia, I think that we'll have enough evidence today showing that we are decreasing the incidence of these problems namely with the G and cerebral oxygenation. So this is a picture of the main operating room in the neurosurgical theater here in Porto. There's a lot of monitors there. And um, curiously, this, the last talk that I have about this, it was last July in a world meeting for neurosurgeons in Barcelona. It was great to talk about this to neurosurgeons. It was really great and the feedback in the end was so good because all the problems are coming from them. They do these kind of things. And uh, Marvin Mays and Susanna Vacas, our colleague from, uh, original from Lisbon, now working in uh, UCA, UCLA, they uh, have they studied a lot the link about the, between surgery and neuroinflammation and the role of hippocampus. And this model, it's very interesting because what they show in this animal model, but it's absolutely uh, equal what happens in humans, is that if you have a peripheral injury like uh, in the model of fracture in the leg of the animal, but uh, an incision done by, done by a surgeon, starts this process of inflammation, leading to significant changes in the permeability of the blood-brain barrier, with expression of neuroinflammation in the hippocampus, and all this process may end in cognitive changes. And this model by, uh, from Mervyn and Susanna and other authors, it's very well documented. For example, in animals with metabolic syndrome, that we can imagine that our, our patients, like in Yucatan, Marusa has, with diabetes, obesity, hypertension, with significant heavy comorbidities that are coming to our operating rooms. And these animals and these patients are those at higher risk to have cognitive problems after surgery. And this is the brain, that organ that Dr. Fernando Nunes taught us to take care even when you are not doing neuro neurological surgery. Do you think that an organ like this enjoys to be turned off or place on old, organ made of millions of 
neuronal cells, of neuronal connections, neuronal pathways, with a proper regulation process like sleep. Do you think that this organ enjoys to be under anesthesia? I, I really don't know, but I, I assume that no. And uh, that's what we discussed uh, uh, some four years ago in this uh, editorial published in the Spanish Journal of uh, Anesthesia. Probably it was not by chance that last November I was in this conference in Israel and in the program you can see that uh, general session about organ dysfunction my former chairman in St. Louis, Alex Evers, was talking about anesthetic binding sites in the brain. I really don't know what was the idea to, um, to discuss anesthetic binding in the brain in a session about organ dysfunction. Probably because the scientific committee of this meeting was already alerted that anesthesia is a dysfunctional process to the brain. And we have evidence of that, for example, in animals, showing changes in the permeability of the endothelial cells in the brain, and uh, increasing levels of, uh, for example, IL-6, very well-known neural inflammatory mediator, and, okay, in animals, uh, age-associated uh, cognitive impairment. The older the, the, the animals were, the worse was the cognitive impairment after anesthesia. But you are going to say it's in vitro studies, it's animals, but we are doing anesthesia to humans. Yes, we are. Look, this paper done in critical uh, care patients and uh, authors identify an index and showing that the higher this uh, hyperemia index was, the higher was the number of days under delirium in ICU. And if you see this paper, I really enjoy this paper, done in children. So these children need to have MRI. They, are, they were healthy. They, they had healthy brains. So they need MRI, and they were randomized to have anesthesia with propofol and with sevoflurane. And by imaging studies, the authors were able to measure the levels in the brain of stuff like taurine, glycine, lactate. Curiously, it's not the same uh, metabolites that our colleagues in neurocritical care measure by microdialysis to see the outcome of traumatic brain injury. That is worse if these levels are higher. And look what happened mainly with the sevoflurane. These concentrations are quite higher. But authors also had a, an index or a score of delirium after emergence of these children. Worse, of course, with sevoflurane. But it's curious because the higher the levels of these metabolites, the worse was the awakening of the children. So, we are, when we give mainly sevoflurane, we are changing all the neurochemistry of the brain of our patients, translated by behavior um, problems, like delirium and agitation after awakening. And in the elderly, we know it, for example, from Alex Becker in NIU, that there are gross changes in the anatomy of the brain in all, in all patients after anesthesia and surgery. So, what happened really when we give anesthesia to an old patient? Well, we are turning to be geriatric anesthesiologists. We have to have a growing old population. And our colleagues, our surgeons, they are doing even more and more invasive procedures to old, very old patients. And we know the changes of the old brain. Emery already addressed this this morning. 
decreased number of synapses, dendritic uh, connections are completely changed. We have even, even decreased cerebral blood flow in the old brain, mainly after the 60 years. I have 10 years ahead to have a good CBF. And so, um, for example, some tasks are, have a poor performance after uh, some age, uh, mainly after the 60 again. And since our first days in the, our residence program, we knew that anesthetic drugs exert their effects at lower blood concentrations in the elderly because all these pharmacodynamic changes. So, it's not surprising that we have even more and more reports like this. Famous American writer said after his CABG surgery, he was not able to write anymore. Not a novel, but a letter for his family. But his heart was okay. And it's not new. John Savage, 1887, published this uh, series of cases of insanity after anesthesia and surgery. Okay, eater. Not a problem anymore. But in the 50s, Bedford was a British internist. He was tired to see patients in awards after surgery with cognitive problems. And the review, uh, 1,200 patients around uh, older than 50. In that time, my age was a problem. And he found 10% of patients with mental problems after surgery. But what I want to call your attention are for those two conclusions. Cognitive decline is related to anesthetic agents and hypotension. We'll see that it's exactly as today. And the advice that uh, operations in, on elderly people should be confined to only necessary cases. That we say today to our surgeons. So today, what do we have? This range of problems. Emergency delirium lasts few hours in the PACU. It's a burden for the nurses, for us, for the family. Then we have the postoperative delirium in the ward, 24 to 70 hours. Can be hyperactive or can be hypoactive. And the delirium hypoactive, for example, can be confounded with stroke. And there we go with more one or two CT scans. And then later on, we can have this postoperative cognitive dysfunction that can last weeks months or even be persistent. So Liz Everett proposed very recently a change in this nomenclature and uh, that's what uh, she suggests with a time frame from days to long term we can have the delirium, delayed neurocognitive recovery and then those NCDs the major or mild neurocognitive disorder, even reaching a level of dementia. It was really recently published in the A and A. And uh, in this month issue of anesthesiology, there's a brilliant editorial discussing if uh, are postoperative delirium and POCD separate disorders, or two manifestations of the same underlying spectrum of cognitive problems after anesthesia and surgery? Well, there are two views. The splitters, they think that they are two completely different disorders, while the lumpers say, no, no, they are two parts of the same problem. It's an ongoing discussion. But what we know is that when delirium happens after surgery, these patients, they have higher risk to have cognitive problems on a long term time. These are in cardiac patients, and that editorial was written about this paper here. Another one showing exactly the same thing, that the 
Cognitive recovery is worse when the patients have delirium after the surgery. Another paper showing exactly the same results. So what do we have about postoperative cognitive dysfunction today? It's a worsening of the intellectual function presenting, for example, as impaired memory or concentration, not detected until days or weeks after surgery. Most of the times is uh, is uh, not is re uh, reported by the relatives, not by the patient, and can last several weeks or even permanent. We know from very a uh, lot of studies, the risk factors and the precipitating factors for early and intermediate POCD. There's no discussion about this. It's clear. And look some of them. Age, okay, it's curious. A low level of education is a risk factor for POCD. Sick patients with a higher morbidity are also at higher risk to have cognitive problems, some genetics, second operation, I mean second anesthesia. So it's not so uh, anecdotal that I have two or three anesthesia, shall, may I have a problem? Yes, you have, you may have if you have all the other risk factors and you do, we do not have to have problems to say this to our patients. A poor, pain a poor pain management is also a risk factor for cognitive problems after anesthesia and surgery. And there are another uh, factors that we can change, other we cannot change, others that we can and we cannot change and they were very well reviewed by uh, Miles Berger in this paper published head of print in uh, anesthesiology at least after cardiac surgery. And uh, several references showing that uh, poor pain management after surgery is very well uh, associated to POCD. And uh, that's a problem because uh, it's not easy to have someone at home with these problems. But these patients, they have higher rates of mortality, as uh, Terry Monk showed several years ago. And what about dementia and anesthesia? That's something that is in the news today. It's anesthesia may cause dementia and Alzheimer's disease. There's some data, for example, this uh, abstract but, uh, it was a poster presented in Barcelona. They, the authors in France, they follow 7,000 patients during 10 years and they found a relative risk of 1.35 to have dementia after general surgery. Or this one, uh, again, um, done in China, uh, it's rate you about two to have dementia after anesthesia and there's something very curious it was Jim uh, who was showing this paper many times there's a lot of uh, similarities between Parkinson's disease and dementia and look the difference between the incidence of Parkinson's disease between anesthesiologists and internists it's quite higher in our group and uh, and it's uh, curious because we may, if we, if we look to the main uh, uh, neuropathological uh, uh, marks of uh, dementia, or Alzheimer's disease, the amyloid pathway with a mutation in the APP, and all the troubles in the tau protein and hyperphosphorylation of protein tau and the calcium, we are going to, show, uh, to find a lot of papers showing that our drugs may trigger all these pathways in vitro, okay, in animal studies, but they do. For example, nitrous isoflurane, they increase the levels of caspases 3, 
and the levels of uh, a beta protein and if we let animals to survive they will have a poor performance while they have increased levels of protein tau hyperphosphorylated as in the Alzheimer disease propofol for example is protective through this mechanism of uh, uh, GM1 uh, expression and uh, in humans again we may find increased levels of tau protein after anesthesia and surgery what is not normal we normally don't have these levels of protein tau in our blood and look uh, I know that it's a very small sample of patients uh, but it's true that these authors found that a poor performance after inhalational anesthesia when compared with TIVA uh, just one cognitive test is uh, it's I would love to see more cognitive cognition tests being evaluated but also higher levels of IL-6 in inhalational anesthesia compared with TIVA and uh, this study compared three groups of patients uh, undergoing spine surgery and they have already a mild cognitive impairment before the surgery and they were they had uh, sevoflurane, propofol or epidural anesthesia and uh, you can see that two years after those who had anesthesia with sevoflurane they have a higher rate of progression in the severity of his cognitive impairment compared with the proper fall and epidural anesthesia and another paper showing exactly the same a better inflammatory profile with TIVA than with inhalational anesthesia another one showing a lower incidence of the delirium when you have propofol than when you have sevoflurane or when you have dexmedetomidine and uh, uh, I think that uh, it was Emery who asked Christian this morning about protective uh, effects of dex this paper it's very interesting so they had patients with uh, acute stroke and they had uh, uh, endoarterial revascularization re with or without DEX and the recovery of these patients was much better when they had DEX during the anesthesia and a long term it's from Ducking Ma group and Mervyn Mays DEX impact is significant you decrease uh, long-term cognitive uh, bad cognitive outcomes if you use DEX during your surgery and in the ICU if the patients need sedation seems that paracoxib it's a good drug because decreases a lot of neuroinflammation in uh, animals but also in uh, humans so what to do with all this information well this is the normal evolution of cognition with age and then we have some patients that they have a faster decline for example patients with some genetic profiles with metabolic syndromes and then we have a third group that are at higher risk but they have surgery and anesthesia and this third group it's where we can Hacked and change things. Now it's not easy, right? Because to keep all the cerebral physiology intact, it's quite harsh. It's quite difficult to keep all these under the normal limits, as Adrian Gelb explored in this paper. And uh, I think that Tony is one of the co-authors of this. Uh, charts published uh, by Michel Strauss and others in BGA a few years ago 
It's true that we know OP, KPD of our drugs, but we lack so many times to measure the clinical effects of these drugs, namely in the brain. So we need it. And we have been telling you this during the day that EEG is the, probably the best or the easiest approach to do it, to see what is happening in the brain of our patients. And we know all these features of the EEG. So if we'll do it, we might measure directly the effects of the drugs that we are giving in the brain. We may tailor the anesthesia to the individual patient and to the individual moments. And we are probably improving the final outcomes. During the last 20 years, we have using these scale numbers like BIS monitor, it was a huge advance in our practice, but we know that these numbers have a lot of limitations and we need something better. Well, for example, in this paper published last year in the European Journal, you see that for the normal range of BIS values, you have patients with birth suppression, for example, or you see a normal range, you see so different power in the different waves of the EEG. So the single number does not translate really what happened in the brain of our patients. So we have this uh, approach that Emery was showing you uh, before and uh, show you also the change of the EEG in the elderly. And it makes sense because if you have less neurons working poorly, the EEG is going to be uh, not so powerful as in the younger patients. And uh, during, if you know something about this during anesthesia, you even may detect some patients who may have delirium and POCD after because they lost uh, posterior anterior cognitivity in the alpha bands. Uh, during anesthesia and in the recovery. But to finish my lecture, I want to call your attention again to this birth suppression pattern. I think that it is the, I don't know if Emery uh, agrees with me, but I think that is the easiest pattern wave of TEG to be recognized. It's like uh, fibrillar ventric, uh, ventricular fibrillation. That's why some months ago in one of my talks, suddenly I had this idea to call birth suppression a brain arrest. And it makes sense because as Emery show in this uh, work, birth suppression translates a failure in the energy production in the brain. So if you see in your monitor a pattern of birth suppression, please resuscitate this brain as soon as possible. Do something. Lower the drug dose, increase the blood pressure, because something is not normal. Because birth suppression only happens when the brain is sick or when it's under an aesthetic drug action. It's not normal. And it's so well translated to the clinical evidence that those patients who had during surgery or in the ICU long time under birth suppression, I mean over sedated, they have higher risk of delirium and POCD, but they have more. They have higher risk of mortality in the ICU. And that's for those young guys, just uh, I need a Cochrane review to believe on what he's saying group. You have it, even with a single number studies. Now imagine if you have a right approach with a spectral analysis, how much more we can decrease the incidence of the delirium and cognitive problems after anesthesia and surgery. If we, with a, just watching the number, we have this decrease. So, and then we have the oxygen. It's a love affair between the brain and the oxygen. And we know how the brain needs oxygen. And luckily, we have now these monitors that, which non-invasively 
measure the regional saturation of oxygen, even with some off-label placements of the sensors, as we can discuss after in the workshop that I'm going to give instead of Chiara, like in this picture. But they work, and Chiara showed it very well this morning. What do we know regarding POCD and delirium? We know that patients with periods of time with a desaturation of cerebral oxy oxygen, they have a poor performance in cognition after surgery. For example, this paper published by Niels Fabregas in Barcelona group in a knee replacement, they found it very, very well. Or in cardiac surgery, it's not new. But what's new is that if you measure it before the surgery, you may identify a population of patients who are at higher risk to have delirium. And we know today, at least uh, after ca uh, in patients uh, 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 with cardiac surgery, that uh, thresholds of 50% before anesthesia uh, is the cutoff value increasing the risk of uh, delirium after surgery. So it's not only what happened during the anesthesia, but before, if you place a sensor in the head of your patients with them breathing air. And if we join both things, if we join the information coming from EEG and from oxygenation of the brain, as David Green uh, showed in this paper, we even can achieve better results decreasing the, the incidence of POCD, optimizing the care of the brain of our patients. And just to finish, I know that some of you know this example. Some time ago, I had a brilliant resident in the operating room with me, and I asked to, well, you are going to run the case, you are going to choose the anesthetic technique. It was a good patient. ASA1, high educational level, was engineer, active marathon athlete, uh, one level spine surgery, a sudden um, crisis, so no chronic pain. And uh, I think it was really provocative technique. Uh, she uh, decided to use desflurane and remifentanil. And optimizing everything, all the analgesic management in the hands, in the PACU, everything. So what we did was to use the EEG with Sedline and uh, the root monitor from Massimo, but we covered the monitor. And uh, true is that in the one hour and 50 minutes, two hours of surgery, she, everything was okay. She was guiding her anesthetic by Mark. That's some, something that, uh, well, Mark. Blood pressure, heart rate, everything was okay. Uh, otherwise, I would say, let's see what's going on. But no, everything was okay. Well, I have to tell you that the PACU was a nightmare. It's one of the worst recovery that I saw in my life of anesthesia. Terrible. Well, we treat that with uh, 25 milligrams of propofol. Patient was quiet, calm. I asked if are you with pain? No, no, I'm, I'm okay. When are you going to start the surgery? Oh, it's done after this uh, small dose of propofol. So everything was okay. So the delirium was not associated with pain. And then we went back to the operating room and we uncovered the monitor. Any volunteer to tell me what's going on there? Well, good MAC values, good heart rate, good blood pressure, good patients, all that black, black, black birth suppression. Mainly on the left, more 
in the left side than in the right side. So my question this morning about the mismatch between metabol uh, when we induce birth suppression for aneurysm clipping. But it's not only the birth suppression. The index was uh, always lower than the lower limits, but forget the index. Just pay attention to the, this black, black birth suppression. You see the amount of time with a brain arrest that this pa patient had? But it's not only. Look here below. We had some free sensors from Massimo. And uh, we place one sensor in the middle of the forehead of this patient. Because theoretically, this patient has no indication for NIRS monitoring. Right? For what? Short surgery, healthy patients. For what? To spend some money with a sensor. So we place a sensor, just one, in the middle of the forehead. So this green line there, it's the baseline, 78%. And you see the amount of time that, with a good ventilation, the patient at values under his oxygenation baseline. So you do not know that this is happening unless you measure it. And then you have to treat the delirium. And you have to delay the start of the next surgery. And you are going to have a mad surgeon working with you saying that you are doing a lousy job. And you are doing a lousy job if you are not measuring what you are doing to the brain of your patients. For the opposite, this uh, patient had a severe cardiac failure. He has this hematoma. We did it with a scalp plug, a TCI of propofol and dexmedetomidine TCI. And uh, well, titrated by the EEG, no changes in the oxygenation. And uh, well, after the surgery, you see the marks of the scalp block there. Probably the right tracks, possibly dex and propofol and local anesthesia titrated by the right monitor. But just to, before to finish, just to call your attention, I think that Emery already addressed this this morning. So you see it's a beautiful pattern of birth suppression, right? It's flat, some spikes there, it's birth suppression. What are you going to do? Resuscitate this brain? Lower your anesthetic concentration? Yes. No. No, because you have a high scale there. You have to decrease the voltage, 25 to 10 microvolts. And then if you decrease to 5, you have the right EEG. It was a good anesthesia. And this can work also in the other direction. Okay. Of course, that's only having a monitor doing, able to do it. You can do it. So, and the same with the spectral analysis. You see, with the 10 decibels, the alpha. It's not so well seen here after the loss of consciousness, but if you decrease to five, it's the good slow and alpha oscillations of the propofol anesthesia. Again, touching with the, in these monitors of Massimo, touching with a finger on the screen, you can change the scales and adjust the monitor to your patients. So, it's time for a change. And the change today and that was my idea when I organized this symposium. It's to make you change your practice. Going back 30 years, and with me not 30, uh, some years less. Um, and uh, it's uh, not, uh, oh, okay, sorry. Um, 
and uh, remembering again your words take care about the brain of your patients see what is going on in the brain of your patients how to do it there's a possible recipe tiva consider propofol and dexmedetomidine avoid inhalation monitoring eg monitoring the nociception and t nociception balance achieving a good pain management monitoring cerebral oxygenation and all the stuff that Christian was uh, talking about this morning send the, the patients fast home uh, and the pain again some summary that you can take a picture it's uh, what I'm saying about the good drugs the good approach for monitoring and please recognize and avoid birth suppression in your patients and uh, in July in the end of Barcelona meeting it's a world meeting for endoscopic surgery of the skull base and spine that's how I finish my lecture to neurosurgeons and ENT surgeons asking them please if you see a monitor of EG in your operating room and if you see this pattern and if you see that the anesthesiologist there is doing nothing act like it's a problem of your patient and ask him to change something because that brain is really in a bad condition so last work for important people in my life like Alexandra and Andrea your Oceva team Jim great guys working here in Porto with me the head of the department of neurosurgery and two anesthesia nurses so thank you and please help the world to fight bulls fighting thank you So if you want to have some questions, I'll be pleased to discuss it with you. Yes, Henry? So great, great job, Francisco. So what Thank do you, you think we have to do in order to put in place guidelines for monitoring the brain? Or what, what, I, mean, I mean, this makes sense, but what, what do we do practically? What, or what shall we do practically? Yeah, we, I think that today, at least regarding uh, birth suppression, we have enough evidence showing that is a bad thing. We never require guidelines to treat uh, ventricular fibrillation. We never need it. So I think that we sh should teach the same way what is happening with birth suppression. And these are some of the papers. There are more papers showing exactly the same thing. With a web uh, teaching like your website or istep.org, placing lectures like ours in the web like as we are going to do with this. I think that the medical community, the anesthesiology community, in some time will understand that we need to change our practice, at least avoid birth suppression. Any other question? No? Yes? The evidence uh, of paracoxib in elderly, it's not so bad as the other uh, NSAID drugs of the family. It looks at paracoxib itself, it's a safe drug or a safer drug. Um, so I have no concern, I have no problems giving uh, 40 milligrams of paracoxib uh, to my patients uh, elderly, even with cardiac disease. 